So the practice of community science around the Salton Sea provides meaningful results that can be used for policy. In this community science webinar, we will hear from some of the youth who have been leading the push to use community science approaches in collecting Salton Sea data that are directly related to community concerns. This webinar, available in English and in Spanish, will present data collected by the community. Uh, I'm now going to introduce Consuelo Marquez, who will moderate this panel. Consuelo Marquez is one of the community scientists in the Salton Sea Environmental Time Series Project. With a BA in Public Relations, she uses her skills in campaigning, art and design, and media relations to uplift and center community voices in environmental justice spaces and more. And with that, let me hand it over to Consuelo. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Cohen. Uh, hi, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Consuelo, um, and I will be speaking uh, briefly on the history of the Salton Sea. So, um, the Salton Sea as we know it um, technically exists only from 1905, um, but it actually sits at the base, at the bottom of the uh, ancient. Uh, Kuwia Lake Basin, which we see here in the Coachella Valley, um, as we're surrounded by the mountains, and then we see like the various um, deposits within those mountains as well. Um, but yeah, the current lake actually sits, actually dates back to uh, 1905, uh, which occurred by accident um, when the Colorado River breached an irrigation canal and then spilled into the Salton Sink, creating now the Salton Sea Lake. Um, and then from then on, the lake um, and its changed demographics ended up experiencing a variety of, of um, social and environmental issues, um, all the way from flooding, water contamination, or just water and air quality issues, and um, issues like that. Uh, so going back to, to, that, to 2003, the quantification settlement agreement between the irrigation um, Imperial Irrigation District, the IED, the San Diego County Water Authority and other, and other entities agreed to divert water from the Imperial Valley to San Diego County, exacerbating already concerning levels of water evaporation. They, um, this agreement existed because they um, just wanted to divert the waters for their own agricultural use, which is fine, um, but it ended up kind of worsening a, the situation in ways that we didn't really expect it to do and at, at, at really rapid rates. So um, in 2017, um, 15 years of water of mitigation water ceased to be allocated to the region. Um, and we see the Salton Sea surface area rapidly decreasing ever since. Once again, this is because of the water, um, the diverted waters, and then uh, because of um, independent environmental factors like global warming and just uh, water vibration levels um, ended up decreasing really uh, fast ever since. And then um, we see that throughout the years, the local communities have been uh, continuously impacted by the lakes changing, envir by the lakes changing um, environmental and social conditions. So for instance, because uh, many of the, what I'll be calling the short communities are historically um, undocumented peoples, immigrant communities, um, sometimes predominantly Spanish speaking commun communities as well, um, they have, uh, I guess obstacles in reporting um, the conditions that they're kind of living under, whether it's just overall social conditions or socioeconomic conditions or um, conditions that affect the public health in general. So because of that, we do see a, an, uh, I guess like an obstacle in the reporting their um, medical conditions. So for instance, many of the communities such as like Bombay Beach uh, report higher rates of asthma in both children and adults. Um, we see that the uh, other short communities um, also, also um, experience uh, intense nosebleeds in children, um, which they kind of link to the, um, I guess just the dry climate in general, but also the um, heavy dust winds because of the exposed playa near the, near the, near the Salton Sea and um, just heavy dust pollution in general from living near, near the lake shore. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, cool. So before we get into the, um, the community science uh, part, portion of this um, presentation, I do want to present that as a member of the Salton Sea Environmental Time Series, um, we kind of built the entire pilot project from the ground up. And that does include <laughs> a website, a data dashboard, 
just the project in general. Um, and because this was my skill set in college, um, I kind of took upon uh, designing the logo for ourselves. And it was a really long and tedious process, but this is what it ultimately is. Um, so we'll be using this across our website, did a dashboard, branding, and uh, hopefully merge our t-shirts when that's possible. But yeah, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Cool. Um, and now we're getting into the community science portion of it. So in general, um, the community science uh, is defined as a bottom-up approach, uh, which allows the local communities and, um, <laughs> sorry, which allows the communities to be the leading party in scientific research regarding one or more areas, one or more issues in their areas. So that can be from, um, I guess, what we would consider kind of informal methods in the scientific research method, or um, even more or more detailed um, research studies uh, when the when it's allowed. So, why do we what kind of what's the value in community science at the Santi you know, period? Um, so it says that uh, community science as a practice uh, increases the capacity of local communities while collecting data that can be used for advocacy. Now, this can be, um, for instance, within our own project, we are collecting uh, water samples to monitor the water quality um, and air quality when it is possible. Um, and then we see that with the collection of meaningful data, community, science, community scientists can then use that data to impact public policy or just um, inform the or inform their community at large uh, when it is possible. And then um, community science encourages historically marginalized communities in guiding, participating, and benefiting from science. So we do know that there is a large, I guess like the overall sentiment that um, science is something that only belongs to the academic side of everything. Um, and we do feel that we being like the average person um, feel that science can be gatekept, gatekept. Um, so it is really hard to access maybe because of our own personal resources or because there really aren't many um, institutions out here in the Valley or in other rural communities that offer these services or offer these resources. So that just having community science at a very local level um, keeps it accessible and allows us to you know, benefit from science um, at all. So why is it important and what attracts people to do it? Um, well, we've always wanted access to these resources um, and data, but once again, it's always been really hard to find the resources um, if they're available or like many of our uh, university students can kind of um, support. It's that we've always had the idea, we have to leave the Valley, have to leave the Coachella Valley or Imperial Valley to, um, to go to big universities to even start to access these kind of resources. And because of this project and others like it, it's, um, it's getting better for us. Uh, we also have hands-on research like the Holland Lab. Uh, we do travel to the shore sampling sites uh, there are boat, we do go on boat rides uh, to the transit sites in the lake. And then we also have the data dashboard. And overall, this project just allows us the freedom to participate and access um, this data. Oh, and this is just um, a map on how uh, community science works in general. So this goes from like the data collection process of it um, and then connecting our like, I guess we, what we consider like our qualitative data part of it, of um, you know, live experiences, cultural familiarity, local advocacy, and then combining all of our, all of our information and experiences, and then um, being able to impact policy and uh, help our community further. All right, thank you. And now I'll pass it on to Matthew Maldonado. Um, and Matthew Maldonado, as a, as a lifelong resident of the Coachella Valley, the sudden sea and its impacts on public health have always been a very important topic for him. Now that he's an air monitor technician for Comité Civico del Valle, along with the Ivan Network, he feels that he can really help his fellow residents live a cleaner and brighter future. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Let me get started here. All right, perfect. All right, so just a quick history of the uh, Ivan network that I work with. In November of 2007, in the southeastern corner of California, in the border county of the Imperial Valley, a small group of residents and a handful of Department of Toxic Substances Control employees led by Comité Civico del Valle 
piled into a school bus to take a tour of the Imperial Valley region, where California Environmental Protection Agency, Cal EPA, has designated residents at high risk for environmental toxicity. The purpose of this trip was to visit multiple environmental hazard sites located throughout the region as identified by concerned community members. After the tour, participants attended a workshop to collaborate and develop solutions to address environmental hazards affecting their lives. Between 2007 and 2010, a total of eight government-sponsored toxic bus tours and workshops took place in the Imperial Valley, a predominantly Hispanic community with a low employment rate. A direct outcome of these collaborations was the conception of the Identifying Vi Violations Affecting Neighborhoods IVAN model. The development and implementation of the IVAN model marks a turning point in the environmental justice regulation history. The IVAN model is reshaping how vulnerable communities protect and in the process reclaim their environment that has been systematically disregarded as a sacrifice zone. And the air quality monitors that we use come in many forms. The monitor we use to take readings consists of a 14 by 12 by seven weatherproof enclosure attached to the tripod or pole atop a building or high altitude structure. Within the enclosure, there is a dials air quality sensor that takes the particulate matter and measurements and microcontroller that processes the data. Also inside the cabinet, a hotspot is placed to give internet connection to the system and all the information can be uploaded to the website unless internet access is provided on site. That is what the enclosure looks like. Comité Civico del Valle and other statewide partners are responsible for managing and maintaining the technical support of all IVAN online websites. All air quality data taken throughout the day is uploaded to our website, ivanimperial.org, where it is updated every five minutes. IVAN philosophy is as follows. Residents are the most knowledgeable about their environment and therefore should have a place at the table with regulation agencies. Since 2010, the IVAN model has expanded to seven other locations in California, most notably the Imperial Valley, where it strives to empower disadvantaged communities to participate in solving environmental concerns. We are expanding to the Eastern Coachella Valley, the ECV, in hopes to advocate for the community and educate the community on air quality and how it affects them. We believe with the proper tools and with the proper tools, the residents of the ECV can, can and will make their communities healthier for, for future generations. For too long, the residents of the ECV have been told something will be done about the Salton Sea with no results. It has made it extremely difficult to champion community support for various projects regarding public health around the sea. Nonetheless, we continue to push and uplift the concerns of the community surrounding the Salton Sea so together we can achieve the seemingly impossible. There's a map of some of the monitors we have. Uh, we actually have three more up here in the Coachella Valley that uh, me and my coworker Edgar were able to put in. And then, of course, uh, a lot of you know what these are. They're uh, the number range of exactly your low, moderate, unhealthy, and very unhealthy risks for anybody that has either sensitive or has asthma or anything like that. And then some of the requirements for our enclosures are just access to a location for installation and maintenance. So we visited every 45 days as needed. Access to power is at least 120 volts. And internet access, unless due to security protocols, the best option would be to install a hotspot. And the installation takes about three hours since most of the equipment is already prepared for installation. And the project staff, that'd be me, myself, and my supervisor, Christian Torres. Thank you, guys. Great, thank you, Matthew. Um, and now we will be passing it to Dr. Sinclair. Dr. Ryan G. Sinclair is an associate professor of environmental Mic microbiology in the Loma Linda University School of Public Health. His current projects evaluate human exposure to pathogens in surface water, wastewater, and in drinking water. Ryan completed a postdoc at the National Research Council Associate Program and was a research scientist with the University of Arizona, of Arizona Department of Soil, Water, and Environmental Science. Pass on to you. All right. Uh, thanks, Consuelo. Um, yeah, so good presentations, um, kind of summarizing um, community science and what it's used for. And then the CCV project with Matthew, um, the Comites project, which is also a community science project. Um, so before our current work, which is with the Thriving Earth Exchange and the Alianza, I, um, <clears throat> I, I, I worked with Alianza and some community partners Olivia Rodriguez and Patricia Leal. Um, and we we actually uh, started this this project to map the shoreline as it's uh, being um, 
uh, reduced. So that was at, we started at about 2018 and went through 2021. And we used a balloon with a camera and walked the shoreline to make some images. And this is, this presentation is gonna show you some of that detail. Um, so why did we do balloon mapping? It's because we need locals who are scientists and who can be versed and uh, skilled in, in, in describing the change in a known area. So the, the North Shore, um, the North Shore area is some place that is pretty famous and it's pretty well known um, for people to, um, to visualize. So what we did is we walked about a kilometer and a half around the shore of the North Shore with the balloon and were able to get some images from there um, over time. And then we also wanted to use this project to kind of relate that, the playa increase. Um, so in other words, the shoreline reduction and relate that to air quality. So is there going to be more dust coming up from this playa and how can we relate it? Um, and we wanted to make data that's good enough for advocacy groups to use. So that's kind of the reason why we chose balloon mapping. Um, we also chose it um, because recognizing that there's a lot of people um, nearby the Salton Sea, so the playa obviously will, will impact a lot of people. Um, in the southern part, there's many communities. In the northern part, um, the total for the uh, eastern Coachella Valley northern population, this is 10-year-old estimate, actually, 60,315. Uh, but this is the, those communities in the eastern Coachella Valley. Um, so what we did for this is um, a variety of things. We, we started with a weather balloon, um, and that's a balloon you saw on the first slide. And then we moved on to um, basically a mylar sleeping bag that we taped together and filled with helium. And those were a little bit more um, robust than the uh, weather balloon. And that was also part of the whole process because you have to tape them together and make them and everything. And then um, this thing here is hanging down from that. Um, this is called a peak of a, and that is a little device that was invented in the late 1800s by people who first started doing balloon mapping. And um, that peak of a is able to balance the camera so it doesn't swing all over the place when the um, wind comes up. So it's kind of like um, what drones have now is known as a gimbal. Well, that's a that's a peak of a. So that's kind of a neat thing. It's it's on string. And then you either get a GoPro or a point and shoot and set it up to take images every few seconds. Um, so then the fun part comes because you need a lot of people to kind of hold the tether and walk the transect. And so you, you, you end up spending a lot of time with community and you end up talking to people about the, um, the problems or the issues going on at the Salton Sea while you're walking. This particular image here is actually from us um, uh, when we worked with a bunch of uh, junior high age boys that were at the Salton Sea with us and that was a lot of fun and they walked around and we got some images from that that was back in 2019 um, and then again you know review it and then discuss it with them um, and then just keep going um, <clears throat> the analysis part you usually have to do that off you know like in on your computer later but what we're able to do with that is um, you get you make the image and then in your next visit out there for the next balloon mapping you're doing, you can actually bring the image and show people what the previous ones are. But you end up creating a, a something called an ortho photo because you take all of those series of images and you put them together in one. And um, that kind of shows what the current shoreline is. And then um, what you're able to do is look at the rate of change um, um, over time. So we weren't measuring this from 2003 to 2017, but we did go from 2018 on. So um, we're able to show the difference in the reduction in the salt and sea from these two time points. This first one, the 2003 to 2017, we're able to show it from the satellite image. And then the second one from the um, our actual balloon mapping. Um, and then we met with a UCR professor, um, Will Porter, who helped us with a, um, a, a weather model to predict PM10 from all of that land. And I'll show you that a little bit as well. Um, so these are some of those ortho photos that I talked about. And you see how they're kind of a blotchy um, borders here. That's because it's a whole bunch of photographs that are put together um, by the, the software that manages the, the, the images. Now, there's a lot of new technology about this now with drone mapping and, and automated things, but we, we collected these from the balloon, so it's pretty cool that we were able to do it in a pseudo-manual uh, method. Um, 
And then what we did was um, we, we put all of those images here and we were able to make transects and we we're able to look at along these red lines here. This was, uh, we were able to con um, sort of describe the speed of shoreline reduction. Um, so how fast is the water um, receding? Um, and then we were able to actually use the satellite image and some of our um, collected images. So if you look here, this 2017 green line and then the 2018 brown line here, this is when we started taking images. And that was kind of the where this picture is from is about 2018, right after the North Shore um, was kind of separated from the rest of the Salton Sea. And that's like our, our first uh, strand line. They call these strand lines here, or they're the lines that we actually uh, measured. Um, and um, these, this just shows two of them that we measured, but 2018 and 2020, and we were able to put it in a model to show, you know, where those, um, where those uh, uh, shoreline reductions are going to be in the next uh, 10 and 20 years. So in 2040, where is it going to be? It's going to be way out here. And that was the model that we used for that. And um, after that model, we're able to take these, um, these point, these, uh, this line here from the 2040, and then um, let me go to the next slide actually from that 2040. And then we're able to actually interpolate that in a model and show um, the air quality reduction. Um, so the, the decrease in the quality of air means that there's more um, um, particulates in the air. And we're able to actually show that um, by 2040, you can have an increase of particulates for PM10 only um, within five kilometers of any location on the Salton Sea. And for this one, we just focused on this little area right here, which is the North Shore. And we're able to extrapolate that out in a model. This is um, a, a YouTube image of, um, of some of these models and what this looks like. And again, we started, oops, let me try to play this. Okay, watch on YouTube. Let me just try to click this. Okay, so we started by collecting data from uh, satellite images and that data was all the way back to, I think about 1998. And then from, or 1996, um, a black and white satellite image of the North Shore Yacht Club. And that's where we started um, kind of plotting our first strand lines. And you see that strand line here, this red one. And so we collected that data all through the quantification settlement agreement, which went from, oh, well, 2003 up to 2017. And um, <clears throat> in that time, you had actually uh, 620 feet shoreline reduction during the quantification settlement agreement. So you can actually look at these strand lines. You walk along the Salton Sea shoreline and you can see strand lines. And usually that's where the water goes up to because that's where the bushes are growing and nutrients and other things are deposited there. So there's kind of a, a place for some of the small vegetation to grow. And anyway, that, that was 620 feet in 15 years over, the, um, over that uh, quantification settlement agreement. And then what happened is the Colorado River is effectively turned off after that. And then you um, had um, another, in just two or three years, you had another um, 348 feet. So right after it took, you know, 620 or 15 years to go 620 feet, but then to go just half of that and only three years after they turned off the water, that shows the uh, much more rapid um, reduction in shoreline. And so that's what this project measured. And then we're able to actually, um, you know, tie that in with, with the air quality as well. So, um, and this is the air quality slide again. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off back to Consuelo. All right, thank you, Dr. Sinclair. So next we're gonna be passing it on to Daniel Ramirez. Um, Daniel is a third year undergraduate student at UCR. He's the Riverside, and he is majoring in biochemistry, and he'll be talking on how we built the community science pro program to monitor water quality. Passing it to you. Uh, thank you, Consuelo. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about um, the, the community science uh, program. And first off, we need to talk about how to get a team together of in uh, individuals, both scientists and community members, to conduct uh, this community-led uh, project. Uh, we use a thriving earth exchange as a tool for forming the program. They provided a form for scientist uh, selection and recruitment. 
Uh, several scientists applied to Alanza, uh, but only three of them were selected. In regards to the community, um, about 50 community members applied to lead the community science project uh, as it being a pilot, a pilot project, only 10 community members were selected. Um, and fifth individuals really say uh, something about the community. There's a major interest in the community. Um, the demographics of the community scientists uh, ranges from high school students uh, to college students like myself and uh, people of order of age. Um, it's also diverse in regards of um, background uh, and, and scientific um, background and also advocacy backgrounds. Uh, you know, there are diverse group of scientists at all different stages of community uh, advocacy. Uh, especially, uh, it's interesting to see the high school students' uh, advocacy uh, and their awareness and what's going on in the community. Um, again, many of me many don't have science degrees, um, but all but all of us have an interest in the community, especially in what's going on with the South and Sea. Can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, so next I'll be talking about the sample collection. Um, Kind of to, to go back and, and what Consuelo was saying um, in her presentation. So why collect the data? You know, with any initiative, there has to be a motive. Uh, there are several factors uh, that influence why, why why this is actually happening. Uh, first off, it's in response to community concerns about air and water quality and its effect on health. This is a rural agricultural community where there are um, numerous um, types of, of crops grown around the communities uh, using fertilizers, uh, some pesticides, maybe even some herbicides. Um, so one can assume that there's going to be some health and, um, impact on the community. Uh, again, to what was uh, being said uh, with Ryan about the exposed playa, there's all these dusty winds that also have um, an effect to, to, to our health. Um, if you ever visited the, the Eastern Coachella Valley, or if you live in the Eastern Coachella Valley like myself, uh, we do have these occasional bad smells. Um, you know, well, what are those bad smells? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from the Salton Sea? Uh, we're trying to find what's uh, what, um, indicators of bad smells, like in sulfate. Uh, should we even be breathing this air? Um, you know, um, Considering the, the dusty winds, the exposed playa, this bad smell. Uh, if you go on and, and see the, the Salton uh, images of the Salton Sea for yourself, the water is not crystal clear. Uh, with these bad smells, you know, one can only wonder is, 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 are there toxins in this water? Can I even swim in this lake? So that's, the, that's what, what the concerns are we trying to, to address with this uh, sample and data collection. Uh, another reason is to provide a um, source for public data for the community. Again, as, as, as what Consuelo was mentioning earlier, um, there's not, the population is mainly um, Spanish speaking population um, and many with, with not a lot of academic literacy. Uh, so we're praying to the dashboard, which will be, um, which we will dive deeper in future slides. Um, another reason is for project design and policy. So project design and policy at the Salton Sea needs to be informed by data. Uh, this data is being collected to influence project design and policy at the Salton Sea, such as in this bullet point, um, upcoming uh, projects like the North Lake Pilot Demonstration Project. Uh, moving on to the next point. Um, furthermore, the community science program was established as a method to show to the state that research project on water quality at the Salton Sea are more than possible. We will see later the instrumentation and our methods of collecting this simple data. But first, you want to next slide? Yeah. Uh, we want to uh, visualize the transect that we built uh, to see the, the actual sites that, that we chose to collect uh, water samples so we could then analyze. In this image right here, you can see the, the bottom middle of the image. Uh, that's going to be our inland sites. Those are uh, two ag canals, agricultural canals directly connected to the Totten Sea. Um, you know, we, we can predict that there's going to be some, some nutrient concentration uh, due to fertilizers. 
or crops such as date palms. Then we also have moving off the shore and then up to what is the Whitewater River. The Whitewater River is an inflow uh, of water containing nutrients from local agricultural practices. And then waterboard data with high levels of nutrients. Uh, there, there's high level nutrients going into the Whitewater River. Another tool that we used is satellite imagery uh, to kind of uh, visualize and, and, and see algal blooms that are visible using the satellite. And it kind of directs us to where samples and data can be collected to find um, some interesting concentrations of nutrients. If we move on to the next slide, we can see actual uh, how we actually uh, conduct these, these analyses in the water. We're using the, the in these two images to the right and the, and the left, we use the YSI multi-parameter water quality meter, uh, which measures uh, several parameters such as temperature, pH, oxygen levels, um, and, and, and an indicator of chlorophyll or algae, and salinity, and a few others. Um, so in these images, you can see that we're directly uh, putting the probe on the agricultural canals in the Southern Sea. We also take this probe, um, this instrument out to the sea on the boats um, and measure the, the, the several parameters uh, directly. Uh, in, re in recent sample events, uh, we have seen increasing uh, levels of salinity. Um, and they have actually been observed that they are approaching the Weinstein multi-parameters maximum threshold. So I think that's a, a very crazy phenomenon that has been observed at Salton Sea. The water um, may be too silent in the future that even the YSI may be unable to accurately measure salinity. This other instrument down below in the bottom left corner is the YSI photometer. And what it does, uh, we, co um, we collect the water samples from the uh, several testing sites. Then we collect aliquots from those uh, bottle samples and then use, use it to see nutrient concentration when we plug it in in the, in the, in the vial on the YSI photometer. Can you move on to the next slide, please? This, these are just more images to show you um, the sighting that we're in. Uh, this is the boat that we use to go out in the, in the water. Uh, we do have two teams out of the 10 individuals. Uh, one team goes out there and samples one day, and then the other team goes and samples another day um, to create these timeline, uh, this time series. So in that image is just half of the group along with our, with our scientists. So these are images that show the boat that are being used in the sample each modeling site along the transect. The boat is very small and the instruments uh, used are the standard, are standard um, um, instruments to conduct water quality um, testing. And I just wanna show again how water quality monitoring is feasible. Uh, even under these conditions, the community science team is gathering reliable data regarding the quality of the Salton Sea water. In this next slide, I have is to show you a, a small video. Uh, Ryan, can you click it, please? Yeah. So that's the, that's the where we meet up. I think this is a really cool video using a, a drone. Those are community members going along the transect to collect the water samples and to analyze the water directly with the YSI. Yeah, those are really cool to share with y'all. The, um, these videos and images of what we're actually doing out there. I appreciate everyone your attention and your time. And I'm gonna pass it back to Consuelo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, next week, and next week we'll be passing it on to Alejandra Lopez. Alejandra is one of the community scientists in the 
Falling through the remembrance of Santa Cruz is set for short if you want. Um, born and raised in Mecca, California, she is dedicated to helping the community in any way possible. With a bachelor's degree in international development and geography from UCLA, she seeks to get her master's of science in geographic information science and technology from USC. I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Consuelo, and good afternoon, everyone. So as Sanya mentioned, we have been doing water sampling and in my portion of this presentation, I will go ahead and elaborate more on our findings. So we did test most of our water samples for different uh, nutrients, including chlorophyll, nitrate, ammonia, phosphate, sulfate, and sulfide. And I will go a little bit more in depth into nitrate. We've measured nitrate at four different locations in our transcript, circled in the panel on the bottom right. The station names are on the x-axis and nitrate concentrations are on the y-axis in units of nitrogen per liter. All the measurements we so far collected for each station are shown. The colors of the circles correspond to the average nitrate concentration at each station. Lighter colors correspond to larger nitrate concentrations. And there are some reference quantities shown in black lines. What you see is that most of the nitrate concentrations that we've measured in the Salton Sea are higher than oceanic levels, higher than the minimum concentrations needed for an area to be classified as hypereutrophic, and even high, higher than the average concentrations measured across eight tributaries in the Mississippi River. This last, this last comparison is important since nutrients in the Mississippi River have led to large algae blooms in the Gulf of Mexico. Similarly, we've been tracking algae in the Salton Sea. Brian, can I go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So in this graph, we compared the average of our observations of chlorophyll in the Salton Sea to over 11,000 observations of chlorophyll from lakes around the world. Chlorophyll is a proxy of algae. The average chlorophyll concentration in the Salton Sea is higher than the vast majority of other observed lakes. This is consistent with the exceptionally high nutrient concentrations which lead to the growth of algae. Next slide, please. So we are seeing high concentrations of nitrate and chlorophyll within the salt and sea. So let's delve a little bit more in understanding what these nutrients and how they interrelate to one another. So the salt and sea is surrounded by agricultural communities and we have agricultural runoff, which tends to be rich in fertilizers and nutrients. We are able to detect fertilizer through nitrate, phosphate and sulfate concentrations. The presence of high nitrate, phosphate, and sulfate typically influences the concentration of algae, which we can, be, which we can detect using chlorophyll. The large concentrations of algae or chlorophyll can create hazardous or toxic water. How does this happen? When algae dies, it sinks to the bottom and it is eaten by bacteria. The bacteria oxygen and creates these oxygen dead zones that hinders aquatic life. This can also be detected as dissolved oxygen. Um, bacteria then can produce hydrogen sulfide, which is what creates this rotten egg smell that we have come to associate a lot with the Salton Sea. Next slide, please. So this, this slide goes ahead and shows a little bit more about that rotten smell that we see. And we have this image that visually depicts this process. In the image, there's a contrast between the concentration of nutrients within the water bodies. The right side of the image illustrates a higher nutrient concentration that leads to greater concentrations of algae that eventually die or eaten by bacteria and respire and use all the available oxygen and create these dead zones. And then that's what then produce also sulfite, which we get th that rotten egg smell. In contrast, the left side of the image, it has a lower concentration of nutrients, less algae, oxygen at the base of the water bodies, and a thriving aquatic life. Note that algae produces a green color and can help explain, along with other processes such as chips and bloom, why the salt and sea is green in color. Next slide, please. When we examine sulfate nitrate chlorophyll spatially, what do we see? For sulfate, we see a higher concentration of sulfate within our stations six, station five, our inlet one and inlet two. And these stations are actually within close proximity to agricultural runoffs. Next slide, please. 
When we examine nitrate, we see higher concentrations within S7, which is also in close proximity to agricultural runoff. And you can see it circled right there in red. Next slide, please. Thank you. For chlorophyll, we see high concentrations in SS4, but an overall high concentration against around all our stations, which again, this indicates large algae presence near agricultural input. These stickers that I showed you are screenshots of our data dashboard, which brings me to our data accessibility and our website. Our dashboard is named the Salton Sea Environment Time Series, and shout out to our community members, David and Diego Bernal, who have led the website and data dashboard development. It was created with the objective to allow community members and other stakeholders to have easy access for water quality data and visualizations. Our data dashboard is a community led web development. And while we have made great strides, it is still a work in progress. We envision this to be an open source platform for contributions. And we, we hope that it will, sell, it will serve to help answer questions on water quality and air quality. Because our communities are predominantly Spanish speaking, we intend to make all the content on this website available in Spanish. So I'm gonna go ahead now and walk you through a little tour of our website and what it looks like. The data dashboard landing page gives background information on the Salton Sea and the project. This homepage has links to view the data on the dashboard and a link to contact information for those who want to get involved in the project. When we click on the view data button, we are taken directly to the data dashboard. The data dashboard can also be accessed within the menu located to the right hand corner. Within the data dashboard section, we can see air quality, air quality data located within the top portion and water quality data located below it. The sensor data and nutrients data buttons will allow those who are interested in, down, in downloading the data to do so. The water quality data component allows individuals to change parameters and include and includes their measurement units. At the moment, the parameters include salinity, water temperature, pH, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, nitrate, ammonia, phosphate, sulfate, sulfide, and others. As mentioned earlier, our website and data dashboard is a work in progress and we hope to share it with the public soon. This concludes my presentation and I will hand it back to Consuelo. Uh, thank you, Alejandra, and thank you everybody for your presentations. Um, and we'll be, we'll be starting our panel discussion. Yeah, so I think for our panel discussion, we, we have some generic questions, but um, I think also we wanted to open it up for questions from um, <clears throat> from others that are that are out there um, that might want to engage with us. Um, so yeah, let's just open it up for questions a little bit. Maybe we could start off with um, with a, a few uh, generic ones. Um, for for instance, um, you know, just just to knock the point home a little bit, why why uh, why do you all on the panel, why do you think people and groups should be using community science as an approach? Um, I can go. Uh, <laughs> the following statement is not indicative of our beliefs um, as a project, as a group. Um, but personally, I, um, I think that it's really hard to, I guess, confide in uh, officials or people in higher positions of power. So I feel like just doing community science um, as a practice in general kind of gives some of that power back to <laughs> back to the people. Um, so that's kind of why I was interested in this project or like since it was first like promoted back in last summer, I believe. Um, so that's kind of personally why I like um, community science. I also think I want to add to what Consuelo said in that it adds movement to this, right? Like many scientists have come prior to our communities and have spoken to the community, but they haven't really gotten a community buy-in. When you have community members who are consistently wanting to 
participate, to be part of the solution, you're seeing the project have more longevity and more momentum. Yeah, those are those are great answers. I, I think that's that's you know what we're looking for. There's two more questions that see, that showed up. Um, Jack Fleck had a, asked about lithium extraction, and then Laurel Firestone asked about for water quality data. Have you worked with the Regional Water Quality Control Board to make sure they can integrate community data into their regulatory program? Um, so, does anyone want to tackle one of those first? Um, as far as I'll, I'll, I'll try the lithium one, um, as far as I have seen the lithium projects from the actual, um, uh, from the geothermal plants, those are a few miles south of the Salton Sea and they're interacting with an aquifer that's lower than the Salton Sea. So I can't say that um, there's no impacts, that's for sure, but I'm just not sure about possible impacts to the actual Salton Sea as it's going now from lithium extraction. I think that the social impacts are certainly there, but the actual um, uh, physical chemical impacts are yet to be determined or I'm not sure about those. Does anyone have anything to add to that? I'll add a little bit. Um... I was never introduced, um, Isabella. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at UC Irvine. Um, I think, like Ryan said, we don't really know what the impacts are going to be so far, but by having this uh, time series that we've started and we do plan to continue it, um, we can at least measure those impacts. Um, so if the lithium plant does end up being built, we will be there to observe and register any changes that might happen to the Salton Sea. Um, we have a question that I feel is kind of related to this. Um, I'm sorry for skipping uh, Laurel, Laurel's um, Firestone's question, but I'll just skip to the next one real quick. Um, it's uh, by Julia Grass, and the question is, um, the comment says, uh, I don't live near Salton Sea, but I'm wondering how local people feel about the changes in the lake. Um, if anyone else wants to go first. I'll go. Uh, hi, Julia. Um, I do live in, in, in around the area. Uh, changes, changes you, I, I, I assume you mean like, um, like water quality changes. Uh, it is a concern uh, for, especially for me uh, and others like me that, as Consuelo said, that, that have um, increasing cases of asthma. I am prone to asthma um, and changes in the lake like like recently shoreline how, how ryan was discussing uh, exposed paya um and not anoxic regions in, in the in the in the water that ultimately result in air quality uh concerns those changes are are very serious and i feel like they they i feel like they should something sh something should be done to kind of decrease the amount of of like those detrimental changes that are happening right um some of the things like i could think about is maybe controlling the amount of fertilizer or nutrient inflow coming from agricultural practices into the sea. Uh, thank you. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to add. Um, so I've lived in Mecca, California, which is less than 1.5 miles away from Salton Sea. And um, it has been a discussion my whole life um, growing up about the smell. I remember one time there was an incident where the smell was so bad that it reached like the LA County and it made it to the LA Times. But in my head and in our communities, it was always, this is such a norm that we get, to, we smell these smells all the time. And it was made such headlines when we're like, this is where we live. So seeing the change in the lake is problematic. Um, like I said, most of our communities are Spanish speaking, but even my mom who is an immigrant and migrated from Mexico, you know, she'll have all hear conversations with her, her having conversations with my tias, my aunts, 
talking about the impact of the Salton Sea and how, when are they gonna clean that up? Why do we keep having all these, um, why do we keep having all these council meetings and nothing's ever really being done? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that we all um, are very much aware and sometimes we can feel a little bit defenseless, I guess, about what to do and how to proceed. I, 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 I also want to add to that real quick. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, just offer a different perspective. So there's a large majority of the communities in North Shore, West Shore, is Mecca. Now, I, my father himself lives in North Shore, so I grew up around the Sultan Sea my entire life. And there are, I don't even want to say some, but a, a good majority of the people that live in these communities worrying about the Sultan Sea for them is a luxury because they're worried about putting food on the table, worried about keeping the lights on, worried about how their kids are going to get to school. That's so worry, asking them to worry about the Salton Sea is almost insane because they're worried about literally everything else that will kill them faster, arguably, than the Salton Sea will. So that's definitely something that I think everybody should think about whenever we're trying to get community support, because I do, I agree with Alejandra. I do, I, even my father himself, my dad's 74 years old, and even he asked me about the Salton Sea, but he's told me that I've heard we're going to clean the Salton Sea my entire life. That, I've been, that he's been in North Shore and nothing happens. And that's really discouraging to people. It's even discouraging to me, which makes me want to do this work even, even more and work harder and stronger to, towards this goal. But that's just something I, I want everybody to think about. Thank you, everybody. Um, so now we'll, we'll go on to uh, Laurel Firestone's question. It says, for water quality data, have you worked with the Regional Water Quality Control Board to make sure that they can enter community data into the regulatory programs? It's for anybody to answer. I, I wanted to also acknowledge Laurel Firestone. She's the um, <clears throat> she's a, uh, um, um, a member of the state uh, water resources control. She's a control board member. So I wanna just acknowledge that. Um, but as far as working with the Regional Water Quality Board, um, it's kind of how we started getting interested in, in measuring water quality on the Salton Sea. Um, we had found out that, um, you know, there was, there was some water quality being measured, but then after the pandemic, I think some of it had stopped. And then even before the pandemic, before um, when, when some things have um, uh, dried up, um, or sorry, the shoreline started receding, then um, the, the boat docks and the boat ramps had dried up. And so there wasn't any safe place for the regional water board to go and do sampling anymore. So we, we had talked to them about that, but we haven't engaged fully on our, um, on our methods just yet. However, um, we are using standard methods with quality control considerations. And so we, we do have that on our, on our radar to eventually get our data to the level where it can be incorporated into the state seeding um, database. And I think that's a really important thing is to get our data in there as well and to start contributing that way because that's kind of the state standard for water quality data. And there's um, a lot of uh, quality assurance, quality control considerations to go in with that. And we are on the road towards that. We've also been in contact with several, um, well, a few um, uh, regional water quality board members and um, trying to get integrated in with that, with that whole process. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ms. Firestone, for that question. Uh, next, we have a question in the Q&A section um, from Jasmine Phillips. And the question is, when will the website and data be available online and how can others get involved? Yeah, so for, <clears throat> for the data availability of the website, uh, right now, it's still a work in progress. Uh, I, I know our, our, our leaders in the web, web development couldn't join us today with David and Diego Bernal. Um, and also Consuelo, I know you're also doing a lot of input in the website. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's still a work in progress. Um, <clears throat> we don't have the exactly um, public availability date, but we are all still working on it. And as of right now, it is still under, under development. 
If I can add Danielle, I'm just going to quickly introduce myself. Hi, everyone. My name is Nina Ruiz. I am uh, with the community science team. I work with Alianza Coachella Valley. So I've been really work a lot with the team and um, coordinating, organizing um, our community field events and um, our advocacy efforts, our uh, advocacy plan outlines. But uh, to answer for the first question, I kind of also add into what Danielle shared is that uh, we will be wrapping up the pilot project um, in March, early March. So we are looking to finalize um, a uh, our data dashboard on the website um, by the end of March. Um, so we can kind of that's kind of like around an estimate of when the website will be available for um, the public to access. We want to make sure that we are able to have um, a final data dashboard that includes um, uh, visuals, images that are accessible to all that visit the website and data dashboard. Um, and additionally, it is going to take some time to also create that um, to translate the um, the information in that uh, in the website in the data dashboard uh, and making sure that we are able to address any anything in regards to the um, any gaps in some of the technical language and, and, um, and knowledge in the data dashboard. So you are taking all those things into consideration in regards to when we'll be able to have the website available. And as far as how others can involve can get involved currently, as we mentioned during the presentation, we do have 10 community members um, as part of this project. But as we continue um, the community science program, we will, we are um, going to be making this um, this opportunity, this program available to other community members that will be that would like to join, whether it's um, whether even if it's just attending field events or they want to be um, they want to be part of like the, the work of the community science program in terms of how we're going to be using data dashboard um, in the advocacy efforts. We are going to be expanding that opportunity and that will also include stipends. Um, currently, we do provide um, $50 stipends for our community members, uh, whether they go out on the field event or also help out on the uh, developing the, the data dashboard. We do provide stipends um, for community members and we will continue to provide stipends for community members um, that uh, join in on the and um, engage with the community science program. So we'll be doing um, outreach, um, including posting on our um, social media sites, uh, particularly uh, within the Alliance of social media, social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, to really be able to get the word out there about, um, you know, being able to engage in the community science program. And um, also, you know, just word of mouth, we already have community members as part of this uh, community science program. Um, and so we want to make sure that if anyone has that interest um, in being a part of this work, we want to extend that opportunity. Oh, sorry, I had an issue. Um, so one of our participants, um, Isa, uh, commented in the chat to say, to say, to add on to, Nis to Nidla's point, we are working on some grant proposals to continue this work and compensate everyone involved. Um, and next we have uh, our next question, the Q&A is from Michael. It says, uh, let's see if I could do this. Oh, forgive my ignorance, um, but I have a logistics question. How do citizens find out about this work, specifically information about how to get involved? And how are the results reported back to the citizens? Do you give talks at science classes at the local high schools? Um, I think for the first part, I could kind of answer this as well. Um, so just about just our general community outreach, um, we've always kind of considered this to be a big part of our work. Also, for instance, um, when we first got recruited <laughs> from the participant side, um, we did find we did usually find out about it through social media. So there is a I guess kind of like a bias uh, because you kind of do have to have, you know, internet access, which is the thing that a lot of the rural communities don't have. Um, so there's that. Um, but we also do kind of like how, like how Nila mentioned, word of mouth, um, <laughs> press or promotion always works. Um, internet um, promotion, so social media, Facebook, Twitter, IG, Instagram, that kind of stuff. Um, and then for the next question of how does, um, how do you want the information to get, um, to get, uh, reported back to the citizens. We do have a um, kind of community outreach forum um, being planned at, and, and it is in the works for maybe March or around April. Um, and then uh, we do want this to be more of like a um, community-centered um, forum 
because we do want the information to be <clears throat> accessible and like in the proper language um, for the people that don't have uh, experience within like the scientific research side of things or who don't have maybe the um, academic literacy like how Daniel mentioned a couple of slides ago, um, just to make sure that that information is <clears throat> excuse me, um, accessible for them. And then I'll pass it back to anybody who wants to answer. I can add in, um, Gonzalo, so and on the rest of what you said as well, we are um, looking to have a community focused webinar where this uh, where it would be um, given in Spanish uh, for particularly for local communities, especially our, um, considering a lot of, as previously shared a lot of com um, community members are native Spanish speakers, so we would are we would are looking to have a community focused webinar and the purpose for that community focused webinar is that this will be for community itself and acknowledging that there's um, you know that are there are methods to be able to make sure the um, the website did a dashboard is accessible to um, native Spanish speakers. We have to acknowledge that um, there might still be those questions in regards to what even is nitrate, what is um, a, a graph, what is an image suggesting, suggesting not everyone has an experience, for example, of being able to read a graph um, and um, be able to understand what that graph is saying about um, a certain um, measurement for a certain parameter. Uh, but that community focused webinar will be for community to fill in that gap and be able to um, explain live about what is included in the data dashboard, what it means, what direction we're going with the data dashboard. Um, and so we'll be inviting community members. We currently work with community members as it is um, now, and not just here within our community science program, but um, that we work with other community members that are act act actively and heavily engaged with um, the work that's happening at the Salton Sea, whether it's with the North Lake Pilot Project or even um, towards the southern end with the um, engaged with the whole topic around um, lithium extraction. We are actively always looking for these ways to be fill in, fill in the gaps in regards to how we can um, uh, share these results with community members and fill in any of the gaps to be able to ensure that this information is accessible to community members and they understand why uh, why this matters and what direction we're going with um, the data dashboard. So that also does include um, engaging with high school youth. As mentioned, currently we do have um, three of our um, three of our community uh, community scientists are um, high school youth. Um, so I I think that you know that work with community members definitely includes youth. Um, aside from uh, other community members um, that might be that um, may be older, we always look for ways to be able to engage with community members, whether it's a community space. Um, that Alianza Kachanlik Rally has with here within community science team and um, with the resilience Salton Sea, but also going out into other spaces such as Kachanlik Valley High School, Desert Mirage, um, to be able to engage youth in the, in this work, and um, also uh, you know not just in terms of um, being a part of the the movement of the work and really advocating for. Um, um, the Salton Sea and for communities of the Salton Sea, but also kind of as, as a way to be able to um, get them interested in, in the science and this work um, and get them in a path towards um, STEM education. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now we do have a question for Michael. Sorry, from Michael for Matthew. Um, it says, uh, can you talk about any changes you've seen from the Ivan data and how that informs CCV's uh, the score air quality flag system. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, absolutely. So there's not uh, a drastic change in air quality from around the Salton Sea. It's, it's been it's been good for the most part for the last year and a couple and some change since I've been there. But the uh, the school systems, the way we do that is obviously after all the data goes into ivanair.org and then they can see exactly where it is, whether it's green, yellow, red. And they they'll put their flags up and you know let any students know that they have any uh, asthma or any other issues similar to that that they shouldn't go outside and nobody should go outside because the air quality isn't good. Now we're trying to implement that on the eastern Coachella Valley through a, a Coachella Valley Unified School District, and that's uh, that's obviously going to be a process. But I'd be really excited to do that and I'd be heading that program. So it's it, it's really exciting for me to do that. 
But overall, the air quality around the Salton Sea hasn't changed drastically. With these recent storms, though, with all the all the uh, dirt getting kicked up in the air, that's changed everything uh, for the last couple of days. So they have been in the more orange and red. But I mean, if you see dirt, you know, you can't see uh, five feet in front of you. I don't think you're going to go outside. At least I'd hope not. Thank you, everyone. Um, are there any additional questions or um, anything anybody else wants to ask? Um, I think we've answered most of the questions we have in the Q in the Q and A so far. But yeah, I'll pass it to you guys. Actually, one thing I would like to um, say is that I will, in the chat I will be sharing a document um, in regards to. Um, uh, shoot, I can't remember the uh, name of the person who asked the question about lithium, um, Jack Fleck. Um, I will be sharing in the, in the chat um, a document that was released a week or two ago by um, the Lithium Island Commission. It is a community response by um, Rod Cal Caldwell um, with Controlled Thermal Resources that addresses um, questions from uh, community members presented at, uh, at a November 17th community forum um, by the Lithium Valley Commission. So we'll be sharing that um, a document that community response here in the chat. Um, it is both in, uh, they released the first in English and about a week, a week later, they did release it in Spanish, um, thankfully. Um, so I'll be sharing both of those documents here in, in the chat with y'all in case it's something that, um, you know, it's not something that you may have been aware that it is out there. Um, so I'll be sharing that here with y'all so that you can have access to, the, access to that, uh, you have that with you and absolutely definitely feel free to share that um, with anyone else that would like to be able to look over that document as well. Right, thank you, Nila. Um, um, oh, sorry, I was just reading the chat. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you everybody for your support so far. Um, we are looking into the chat to make sure we didn't miss any questions. Um, so, BRB. We have a couple of questions in the actual Q&A section that haven't been answered. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, I was like, I don't know the mechanics of, of Zoom so far, but um, I was looking at this and we have, yeah, so we have another one from Michael and it says, um, I know that NASA has a citizen science program that might apply to this. Have any of you considered approaching them to help with this? And then Ryan is uh, typing an answer. Oh, I'll just uh, speak it, I guess. Um, yes, uh, you know, for sure we're talking uh, with Isa and others in, in our group to apply for the, I think it's the roses um, and it's coming up in about a month and a half or so is when the deadline is. But yeah, we we are wanting to do that, that program. Um, so we might we might shoot an application off in that direction. But I'm going to I'm going to ask you about it, Michael. Thanks for bringing that up. And I know personally, we always talk about like the behind the scenes about funding. So we're looking for opportunities um, for that. And then, I know, which is interesting. And then uh, we do have one of the questions that says, um, asking us of uh, what should agencies do with the data that we're collecting? Make it public for everybody to see and to make their own decisions about. I would say it would definitely be step one. Yeah, I know that personally, we always like the work that we're doing. It's, I mean, the end goal is that we do want the community to have the information and then, um, you know, like empower themselves to community advocacy work um, on their own side. Um, but I know that personally, we are working towards kind of um, to start working in both community outreach efforts, but also see um, how will we work with uh, creating public policy or just working in that field general in general. Because I know that public policy um, is a word that's really easily thrown around <laughs> in these spaces, um, but then once again, it's the accessibility from the you know the regular citizens to knowing what public what, pub, what public policy is, how it's created, how it's implemented, how it's going to affect them, and then almost oh, no, almost always most of the time, almost always, um, the community isn't really taken to, taken into consideration and isn't really a part of the policy making process. So um, I know that personally, 
we do want these agencies to see that there are efforts in the community um, to kind of to gather this type of information and, on, and then also kind of, I don't, I don't know if it's in English, but like um, see themselves go forward, like pro, like progress or, you know, go forward um, in, you know, their communities and just improve their life overall. Um, I just saw the comment from B and um, I, I wanted to raise that up. I think it's important to talk about the air quality districts approach to um, involving community in the steering committee. It's certainly controversial still. I mean, I think anything where you have a state mandate for any kind of community involvement towards uh, mitigating pollutants is always controversial in environmental justice arena. But um, you know, it's it's definitely uh, more progressive than a lot of other programs, and I think that the water board has uh, at least a little bit to learn from the air what the air districts have been doing with um, the steering committee. Now, there's a lot more work to do with the steering committee. That's for darn sure. But I think that um, uh, the the method that they use for the AB 617 is certainly a, a useful engagement method, and it can definitely grow and improve. But the water, um, the water boards and the water districts could um, also, and even the Salton Sea Management Plan and everything, the, the method of community engagement, I think, is a little bit more advanced in the air districts than it is in the in the water districts. I don't know if anyone, that's that's certainly an opinion of mine, but um, I don't know, Matthew, what do you think about that, being involved in all of that? Uh, I mean, I, you know, honestly, just uh, a shout out to Assemblyman Garcia, because uh, he he did champion that that bill for a long time, ever since I was in high school. You know, he's, I've, I've talked to, uh, I've, I've heard him, excuse me, talk about, talk about that. But I think community input, you know, that's, that's really what we need because that's who's going to be affected by this and that's who we need to get this work done. So, you know, controversial or not, that's definitely something that we need. And I do agree. It's very progressive. And I think heading in the right direction and a good foundation for us to keep building off of. Hmm. Yeah, you know, um, this presentation was mostly our Thriving Earth Exchange uh, project, but, you know, I also want to highlight that we we have um, CCV in here and they they approach community science from a different perspective um, a little bit like, well, well, I mean, it's the same perspective, but they are doing a much different project. But what what we end up doing um, with our community science project with the Thriving Earth Exchange is we're we're actually going to be getting the air quality data from uh, live feeds from the air quality sensors that are out there with the AB 617 and with the state carb and everything. And then um, we're going to be putting that on our community science website. So we'll have both air and water quality on the one, the same website. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, and now for myself, for um, I guess the same comment. Um, I have a lot of strong opinions regarding this kind of question. Um, and just you know the, what should be a symbiotic relationship between, um, I guess like government officials or just the offices and then like what, what the community is and how they participate within that. Um, I just know that like this relationship is never a bad thing. It should never be a bad thing. Um, but I know that in practice it has had its, it has had its ups and downs. Um, and then with a variety of kind of, um, community opinions towards either um, like the way it's actually worked. I know that a lot of people have never really felt supported by politicians in the ECV. I mean, kind of throughout the entire country, but in the ECV specifically, because um, like how we've <laughs> said throughout the entire presentation of we've had these concerns, we try to address them. There really isn't any um, feedback from people in positions of power. So there is a general sentiment of like, okay, why bother doing this kind of work if it's not gonna help anybody? But um, I just feel like, like how Matthew mentioned, just continuing with this work and making sure that we do go forward in the right direction is um, kind of the best option for everybody. Thank you. Um, and uh, if no one has any more comments for this, um, I will go to the next question in the Q&A. Um, it's from Gabby Schubert. Uh, the comment is, uh, great presentations. Uh, excuse me if I missed the link to the dashboard. Um, would you kindly post it in the chat? Um, 
I think at the moment the dashboard is still really um, in the works, um, but we do have plans of creating a kind of like a, I forgot the word for it, <laughs> like a sign up list um, so that if you are interested in it, we do have, uh, we do want to set up some type of a registration email system. And then if you want to like uh, leave your emails in the chat, we can set that, we can set that up later on and then send an update once it's ready. Thank you. So if you guys want to put your um, emails in the chat, you feel safe, or if you want to DM anybody if that's an option, I'm not really sure, um, you feel free to do so. Thank you. Um, to add on to, to, add on to Consuelo's comment, um, we will also be sharing it through um, uh, Yance's social media, um, including uh, a uh, newsletter that we have. So you can all, um, definitely always um, keep an eye out in Alianza social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and uh, if you go to alianzacv.org, you can also sign up for um, for the newsletter where that we will, once the uh, data dashboard um, goes live, we will also be sharing that, um, the link to that, sharing um, the data dashboard on that newsletter um, so that you will, uh, folks will have access to that and know that it is, um, it is available once, uh, once we're able to put it out there. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. Um, I am. So I am. I'm recording the emails. Um, so if you guys want to continue to do that. Um, does anybody have any more questions or um, anything you guys want to address, either the panelists or the audience? There's this comment about. Um water justice exchange out of the engineering sciences department at the University of San Diego, um, headed by Marissa Forbes and um, Odesma, who are great folks to hook up with, and your dashboard could also hook up with the Equinox dashboard at the USD too. Okay, yeah, you know, we really want to start getting this data out there and integrating with other dashboards. I mean, that's all part of it. Okay, well, um, and again, you know, I think we should say that our community science with the Thriving Earth Exchange project, um, as for that one, uh, we are ending the phase one pretty soon, but we're going to start a phase two, and we'll be start soon, um, I think, um, um, looking for and recruiting some more participants, um, where phase one participants stay on and, and help with the phase two. Um, that, but also, um, you know, there's other ways to participate, even with the Ivan uh, community science and other, I think there's other community science projects going on as well around the Salton Sea with the Audubon and others, but maybe Matthew, you can, you'd say if someone wants to get involved with your project, what would they, what would they do? I will send a link to the website right now. Okay, great. Yeah, I know that um, we've always had like, we've mentioned this a while back that we had like about 50 applicants in the first round um, for the for what is the current pilot project. Um, so yeah, I'm just excited to see what happens and um, how, how the project continues. Well, I think this has been great. I really want to thank the um, community science team, Consuela for moderating and, and um, uh, Ryan and Matthew and Daniel and Alejandra and uh, the entire team and a uh, special shout out to Carlos for interpreting. I hope there's been uh, participation in the Spanish channel as well. So this has been our first webinar from the Pacific Institute, which is gonna be a, in a series of webinars on the Salton Sea. The next one will be on April 19th, talking about uh, avian diversity and abundance at the Salton Sea. Uh, further emails will go out about that and registering for that one. 
Uh, this webinar has been recorded. It'll be posted, uh, the link to this will be posted on the uh, Pacific Institute website at www.pacinst.org. So you can uh, check back on that soon. So um, again, thank you to the team for bringing community science. And I think as you've seen through the chat, there's been a really positive response to this. So thanks again, and I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you all for attending. Bye, guys. Hey, thanks, Bye. everybody. <laughs>